FYI, I am wearing my Rare Beauty lip gloss today because I am hashtag Team Selena, hashtag I hate mean girls, hashtag I hate bullies. Hey, hey, party people. Today's question comes in the form of an email that I received. Can creating and designing a fashion collection allow a form of positive escapism for the one creating the collection? I wanted to ask you, as you design in Watch Me Design a Fashion Collection, during season one and two, your main goal is to show us how a person can go about making a collection. But I was wondering if you find yourself able to relax while designing these collections. Do you find it to be a nice breather and give you a sensation of escapism? My first question is a breather from what? First of all, what is escapism? Eh? To me, escapism is zero thoughts about work, complete removal from work or anything that t requires a lot of effort, but still gives me joy. Okay. And, uh, you know, one of my forms of escapism is reading. And for relaxation reading, I don't read anything involving with fashion. One time my sister tried to recommend to me a book where one of the main characters was a fashion designer who was building his company. And I was like, hard pass, hard pass. Because I would sit there and nitpick all the things the author got wrong or just relate to it too much entirely. Or it would read too much like one of the many emails I get from clients, uh, students about how they want to break their break into the fashion industry. No, hard pass. That's not escapism. Cooking is another form of escapism for me because it has nothing to do with work, nothing to do with my day job. And, you know, I can just get really absorbed and get in a zone where I'm just like chopping and whisking and, you know, like play podcasts and it's like I've been cooking for myself, my family, my husband for so many years. Like, you know, I can make a kimchi to get almost blindfolded. Okay. Honestly, I find these questions a little annoying at best and insulting at worst because listen, the first question is, can designing be escapism? The second question is, am I able to relax when doing my Watch Me Design series specifically? And you know what? Design for me is not escapism. Design is work, and it's work I enjoy a lot. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. I would have changed, you know, if I didn't enjoy this anymore, I would have changed trajectories and pursued something else. But I do enjoy my work. I love teaching. I love fashion. I love talking fashion with my Patreon group. I love designing new projects and coming up with new ways to teach y'all. But it's still work. It's very enjoyable work, but I call it work because it requires a lot of effort. There is definitely uh, a group of people out there in the world that think, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. But I don't see it like that. I just think it's great that I get to have a career that I enjoy, but it's still work. And I enjoy it because it taxes my brain and challenges me in new ways with every project that I do, okay? Because I get bored easily and I wouldn't wanna do something that was just too like in the zone all the time. Here's the thing, to me, escapism implies a lack of effort, as I mentioned before, and uh, you know, it takes no effort for me to take a nap or read a book and you know, designing is effort. It requires effort. Okay. The second question is especially insulting because the insinuation is because, you know, am I aimlessly sketching on camera because I'm not designing for an existing brand and I, that means I can be less thoughtful, less careful, just enjoy and kick back and just sketch, blah, blah, blah. Um, but no, okay. I design in any class I teach, whether it's on Patreon, whether it's here, whether it's in university, every design sample, every design tutorial is centered around designing as if I'm gonna try to make this in the real world. 
Because as I say many times, a designer's true medium is not the pencils or markers that they use to sketch, but fabrics and the actual construction garments that pattern makers are the engineers of fashion because they're going to figure out how to construct these things. But also designers have to help that construction process by designing things that can be constructed. So if I'm not teaching design tutorials in a way where I'm designing clothes that can be made in real life, then what's the point? When I sketch on camera for any design tutorials, there are many, many things that run through my mind. I take that back. Anytime I'm sketching anything, whether I'm just like doodling in my sketchbook while I'm traveling, just playfully doing things on my own, but also, and in particular, while on camera and trying to teach design successfully, I think about, I think about how this garment will be constructed in real life, okay? The way the back and sides will look because, hey, no coffin garments, remember? Um, whether or not it follows the design direction. And, you know, in, on my channel, it's mostly design directions I've given myself, but the whole point is to follow the design direction. Okay. I think about whether or not it will look good in any of the colors that I chose for the color story. I think about whether or not it's going to look good in real life because things look real different in sketch form and in real life form. And so I'm thinking about that at the same time. I think about whether it's going to suit the customer, the customer profile I've created for the collection, whether it's going to work for the brand whether it suits the season that I'm designing for. How many of y'all have tried to design a collection and all of a sudden, because you got inspired, it started veering summery when you were meant to design a fall winter collection? Okay? You can't do that in real life. You have to design for the season that you're, that's in front of you. Okay? you know, I think about how the fabrics are, you know, which fabrics to use and how the fabrics are going to affect the overall look and whether or not I'm sketching it to the correct approximate drape so that the sketch looks approximately closest to the, what it's actually going to look like in real life. Okay? Um, do the proportions work in a flattering way on the body? Uh, also, is my customer the kind of customer that is concerned with figure flattering proportions or are they really into, you know, new silhouettes, pushing the boundaries of silhouettes, working with shapes like they don't care if something oversized makes them look a little bit fatter. They're really going into the trend. You know, what what is my customer think about proportions and body flattering and all these things? OK, and then constantly. Every time I lay down a line of pencil, I'm thinking, can I construct this? Can I construct this? How would this be made? Am I right 100% of the time? No. Okay, because sometimes you design things and you think you can make them. And then as you kind of work things out in the flat process, you're like, oh, this would be really hard. So maybe I need to adjust the design so that a body can get in it. How many times have I said, what's the difference between a sculpture and a dress? you got to get a body in a dress. So where's the closure? So these things are all like in my brain as I'm sketching. And when I'm designing to teach, I have to be more on point and more obvious about these things so that students can really grasp the lesson I'm trying to teach. I think sometimes that people think that because I speed up my drawings that it really is that effortless. And <laughs> it's not. Um, I am not going to sit there and let you watch me sit there hem and haw and think about things in between sketching. Okay, how boring would that be? Okay, that's something that's something you would do in a live stream, maybe. Like, let me know in the comments if you want to do like a live stream of me sketching so that you can really see how long it takes me to design a dress and how long the spaces are in between. And maybe it'll be less boring because I'm chatting or whatever, but I edit out the gaps. I speed things along because on top of all the things I have to worry about for teaching design. Okay. She asked me specifically if I'm in a relaxing space when I'm filming my watch me design series, I am thinking about the algorithm. <laughs>
I'm thinking about whether this video is going to be interesting for my viewers. I'm thinking about getting shadow banned. I'm thinking about things like, am, am I sketching outside the frame of the camera? I Sometimes I look down and think, oh man, I really should have lotioned my hands this morning, okay? And I can't do it now because then my hands will be really shiny and catch the light on camera. I have to think about when before shooting I can lotion my hands so that it doesn't look weird on camera, okay? Seven and a half years into doing a YouTube channel and sometimes I get paranoid that I didn't hit the record button. So I have to double check. Should I double check now? Am I recording? I will say that initial ideation of a collection can be immediate and it can be a form of escapism, that brief period, okay? Like for example, if you recall my football padding inspired collection, okay, the one that had a lot of corsets and shoulder accents and lacing, and I did the whole runway kind of walking lineup illustration for that collection. The initial sketches for that collection were done in an hour on an airplane ride. And it was a great like just flooding of ideas. And sometimes it can be like that, but that's not like the average, okay? I think it does a disservice to the people who work really hard on their designs to be like, you know, is it easy? Do the ideas just flow? Does it... I think that a lot of practice and preparation can help you reach these moments where when you sit down and have a minute that you can release a lot of these ideas that are flooding your brain and sketch a bunch of ideas out. But then later on, the application of these designs are where the work really comes in. And it is work. It requires effort. It requires knowledge. It requires practice and experience. Even if you're not experienced, it also requires experience from others to help you put your collection together. The initial ideation of a design collection, that beginning part where you get really excited about a new collection, those brief moments can be escapism for sure. But when you have to get to that point where you are applying that to real life, whether it's simply a, you know, a portfolio project or a full blown going to be closed project, it's whether it's for your brand or for a school project, that process is still work. And that process is still part of design. Design is not just that initial ideation stage. Okay. That's what makes a true designer is to be able to take that and to move with it and be able to like most designers in the industry. No, they're not making patterns and cutting, but they've taken the idea and made it into, you know, some form where it can be made, whether that's a flat or their own drape. Maybe they're better at 3D putting together a tech pack or guiding the tech pack so that it's on the process of getting made, like a real life thing. And all of that is work. And trust me, all along the way, small design decisions are made to make sure that whatever it is you're designing is the perfect garment. It's not like the ideation part is the only part where you get creative, okay? When you're in these meetings, for example, okay, I'm gonna have customers who think, you know, wood buttons are a little too kitschy for an urbane look. They're not going to do a wood button. So you're looking at all these buttons and you're thinking, you know what? Our customer is going to want a horn button or maybe a plastic button that looks like horn. Okay. Some designers or some customers are going to want a zip front. Some customers are going to want a snap front and all those snaps are going to be different colors, like little skittles lining up the front of a jacket. All these little things, they are design decisions. They make a lot of impact on the final garment. They are part of the product development process. They're all part of the design and it all requires thinking about your customer, thinking about your, bu your budget and the price point for your customer, all these things. Okay. And that requires work. It's enjoyable. I love it. You know, I have had many a meeting where we just look at like five different kinds of buttons and we're like putting them on swatches. And I like that kind of thing. I like it. I enjoy it. It's not escapism. It's different. <laughs>
This whole thing reminds me of Karl Lagerfeld and Yves Saint Laurent. And if you don't know, those two actually started out in design at around the same time. And they were, um, if I were going to, obviously, I don't know them, but if I were going to put a, like a word to their relationship, I would say they were frenemies. Okay? But at the time, you know, they were both really big time designers starting out around the same time. And so j fashion journalists love to pit them against each other. And so maybe they were more friendly than we think. And we just didn't know because journalists are like, you know, this prodigy, young, beautiful French boy, Yves Saint Laurent, and the hardworking German, Carl. And Carl notoriously hated being considered the hardworking German because the assumption was that Yi Saint Laurent was this absolute gifted genius and designing was so low effort for him. And he just created these things. He didn't create nothing, okay? He had a whole atelier behind him. But he created all these things and magically, poof, poof, poof. And, and Carl had to work for it every step of the way. And it made it sound like his talent was less because he had to work so hard for it. And if, you, and if you think about the course of their careers, especially in their latter years, it's ridiculous because Yves Saint Laurent had PTSD from going to war. And he camped out in Morocco smoking endless opium, okay? And Pierre Berge, who controlled and took care of all the business aspects of Yves Saint Laurent, he would go down to Morocco grab Yves Saint Laurent by the scruff and haul his skinny little butt back to Paris and say, design a collection. Get to work, my man, we need to design some stuff. And so he would sit there and do it. And the absolute first second he could, he would fly back down to Morocco to smoke more opium. And listen, if that man were alive today, actively designing today, He'd never leave Morocco. He'd be camped out there, occasionally sitting in front of a Zoom screen. He didn't, his escapism was Morocco and drugs. He went down there and just was dragged back to Paris to work every single time. Whereas Carl, I mean, he was happy to be as absolutely prolific as he was. You know that he designed for multiple brands simultaneously, you know, had his own brand, did Chloe, did Fendi, did Chanel. Like he was with Chloe for a really decades, with decades before that he, um, before Stella McCartney became the creative director over there. I mean, maybe he wanted to live a Yves Saint Laurent lifestyle. I feel like he was very happy to be working. I feel like from what I've read of his life, I think he was very happy to be designing and maybe he found it to be escapism. Maybe he thought more like me in that design was work, but it was work that he enjoyed a lot, but he was in it. He liked it. He was who designs for multiple brands if they don't like it. Okay. And so when you think about it like that and you think about this question, it's really amusing to me. Um, so yeah, the so-called genius, the so-called like, you know, Yves Saint Laurent embodies a lot of what pop culture thinks of as fashion designers, where they just show up and flit around and, you know, make some final decisions and it's all very easy breezy. You know, there's that infamous story of Yves Saint Laurent showing up and taking up, like trashing the whole collection that they've been working on and redoing a whole new collection in what was it, 10 days? And people, you know, mythologize that story, but it's like, another example of how design is work and sometimes it doesn't work so you have to trash it and do it all over again if it was so effortless and perfect every single time you know all that to say that fashion is the intersection between art and commerce i know you've heard me say that a hundred times if you watch a lot of my videos you're like zoe yeah i get it i get it okay but fashion is the intersection of art and commerce and i think the best designers are thoughtful of striking the right balance between the two in a way that suits their projected customer and brand image.
Okay. Listen, okay, just... Mm, okay, just the question clearly was irritating me and I'm getting on rant level at this point. But I just want to say one last thing is like, even if you are just doodling, maybe if you are just doing free flow ideation day, brainstorming and everything, that's great, okay? However... If it was so easy for artists and designers to just come up with stuff off the head, then they could never have a bad drawing day. You know, Picasso would have never had a bad painting day. Like, I hate the idea that art creation, design creation, doesn't require effort, doesn't require practice, doesn't require work and forethought and planning, because it does. It really does. And for all the people who are working hard in the industry to strike that right balance between art and commerce, to come up with cool things, but still selling enough things to stay in business, this kind of question does a really big disservice to those kinds of designers. But you know what? I am, of course, only one person. And, uh, you know, you tell me, do you consider designing a fashion collection a form of positive escapism? Do you think, are you one of the people who think, you know, do what you love and you never work a day in your life? And, you know, as usual, if you disagree with me, I'm totally fine with that as long as you are polite and respectful about it. I'm all interested in hearing different opinions as long as you're not rude. So drop me your comments below. Today's story time, I'm going <laughs> to tell a story about when work paid off for a brief shining moment. Okay. So I've told you before that there are a few different kinds of trade shows uh, that fashion designers can get involved in. And the one kind is where fabric people show off their wares to designers and designers go and shop for fabrics for their next collection or other kinds of trims, services, that sort of thing that designers use. And then the other kind is where completed samples are sent to to trade shows with salespeople and trade uh, salespeople are selling the clothes to wholesale buyers, okay? And typically in those settings, designers are not at those sales booths. They let salespeople do their thing. In this particular circumstance, my boss at the time wanted me to go walk the shows because we were thinking of leaving the show that we exhibit with often and switching shows. In Vegas, a couple of times a year, they do the trade shows and they do them all on the same day so people can visit all these multiple shows in one trip. So at the time, Magic was the biggie and it held a lot of different categories, including some production stuff. Pool was more cheap and cheerful, juniors, okay, before it got overrun with the big fast fashion conglomerates. Coterie is contemporary. West Coast, West Coast exclusive was a little bit more a little bit older, a little bit more conservative customer. We were showing at West Coast Exclusive and my boss was like, do you think we should switch trade shows to, to show at? It would give us exposure to different buyers who maybe did not want to visit West Coast Exclusive, okay? And so she told me that we should both go during the next trade show season and walk the shows, catch a vibe, see how we would fit in, how our product would fit in. She, so she devised this plan and I don't even know why. I don't think it was because she was cheap. I don't know why. But she decided she was going to go and visit the first day of trade shows and get a room at the Venetian. And she was like, what if I got a room and then I leave and then you come back to walk the second day of shows and you just take my hotel room and I'll make sure the maids switch out the, sheet, the sheets for, for you. And I just, I was like, um, I guess so, whatever. I didn't really think too much of it. I went there in time, like during the first day so I could start walking the show the next day. I meet my boss at the lobby and she's like, Zoe, I got us the best room. And I was like, what? <laughs> and she says to me, so when she checked in, okay, she, when she checked in, so she was a little bit, I think she was in her late fifties at the time. And she, when she checked in at the front lobby at the Venetian, she was like, she was talking to the front desk clerk and she said, do you mind if I can get a room close to the elevator? I don't care what floor, I would just like a room close to the elevator because my feet have been bothering me. I mean, they're like, and the front desk clerk 
starts asking her questions about her feet and how they feel. And at some point, okay, my boss and her are talking about symptoms and body aches and all this stuff. And the front desk clerk was convinced that my boss had cancer. And honestly, my boss, she just didn't want to walk more. She knew she was going to walk in the trade show a hundred miles. And so she didn't want to walk more once she got back to the hotel room. So she, all she did was ask for a room closer to the, ho to the elevator if there was one. And she did say her feet were feeling a little bit numb, whatever. Okay. The whole point is the front desk clerk just decided that my boss had cancer and she was so upset. Listen, my boss, she was super chill. She was a gajillionaire but she never flashed it. She didn't wear huge luxury, if anything, very quiet luxury. Um, she had multiple homes, like that sort of thing, but she didn't dress very flashy. She didn't act flashy. And so I think that the front desk lady was like, okay, I'm going to spoil you because you have cancer. When you get home, you need to go to the doctor and everything. But for your trip, I'm going to spoil you. And she gave her this fat, fancy upgrade for this gorgeous suite. And what's my boss going to do? Say, no, I don't have cancer. Please give me a regular room, even though this is not costing me anything. No, nobody's doing that. <laughs> oh, I snorted. Um, so, yeah. So when it was my turn for the room, my boss meets me in the lobby and she is like, yeah, I... So we are staying at a very fancy suite. Enjoy the room. And she gives me the key and she leaves her to the airport. I get there. It's, it's gorgeous. The room has been cleaned totally. And it was funny because um, my girlfriends, I ran into some girlfriends of mine from college at the trade show. They were working some other section. And we ended up partying in my room that night after we did all the trade show stuff. That was super fun. But well, I think that was a little karmic reward. By the way, I still continued to work for her for another year after that, and she was fine, you know, at the point I left. She was fine. No cancer. Rant of the day is in response to another email I received. I was wondering, how do you find a unique selling proposition for one's fashion business? I am currently starting an e-commerce business selling children's clothes. However, I realized recently that our designs seem to be sadly quite generic and indistinguishable from any other brand. How do you go about creating something that stands out from the tens of thousands of brands out there and fills an unmet need? I have been cracking my head over this. Thanks a lot. Unique selling proposition for children's clothes. First of all, I hate corporate speak. Gross. Okay. Second of all, as I said before, Fashion is the intersection of commerce and art, and most designers forget the commerce part, but you, email writer, have forgotten the art part, um, the part where you carefully consider what is out there, market research. Um, you look at what's in the children's wear market, both in terms of aesthetics and function, okay? Because if there's any category that requires the function of a garment to be involved in the design of it, it is going to be children's wear. It absolutely will. Adaptive apparel and children's wear, where the function must meet the form. You find what's missing, you fill the gaps, you know, you try to fill the gaps with thoughtful design that appeals to two customers. One, the child wear, who will potentially wear the clothing, and two, the parent, family member, whatever, who will buy it. And Third, this person is obviously wants me to tell him for free, uh, something that consultants would charge literally thousands of dollars for. And this person has obviously never watched any of my fashion design tutorials or my how to start a fashion business series. Okay, so that's super fun. Um, here's the thing. Why do you think that fashion design process is not the same, exactly the same for kids? It's exactly the same for kids, except, yeah, you have to think about two different kinds of customers because you think that you only have to appease the parent buying the clothes because they're making the purchasing decisions. No, because they buy stuff. And if the kid refuses to wear it, the kid refuses to wear it. Have you ever tried to dress a toddler who didn't want to wear what you were telling them to wear? They're not going to wear it. And even if they put it on, if they don't like how it feels on their bodies, if the fabric is 
scritchy scratchy or if there's a tag that is bothering them or a button or a zipper the inside of a zipper that's sitting on them funny they don't want it they're, they're they refuse okay a lot of adults they will suck it up for the sake of fashion not me i am too old to not be comfortable but really like kids will not why do you think I always want like to build a children's wear line that's size for adults? Because that's me, okay? I want something that's comfortable. I want something that's cute. I don't want anything itching me, bothering me, scratching me, none of it, okay? I want the clothing version of platforms, okay? Platforms are my ideal shoe because they're cute. They make me look taller because I like being taller, but also they're comfortable, okay? That's what I want. That's all I want in life, and so do kids. That's what kids want. If you want a review on the design process, let's go. Number one, you have to figure out what your brand freaking stands for, okay? Your brand, I think this word has become uglified, you know, in the, in the world right now, and it makes designers and artists sound like sellouts. But what I mean by brand, it's like, you have to have a consistency so that people want to return and buy more of your stuff. And so you have to have a consistent look you have, have to have consistent sizing and you have to have consistent pricing, okay? And so what is your brand? You got to figure out what your brand is, what you stand for. What are your brand values, okay? Do you believe in sustainability? And in what segments of sustainability are you going to tackle first? Um, is one of your brand values size inclusivity? Is one of your brand values um, adaptive apparel for differently abled people? Like brand values, like you know, developing your brand and sticking to your brand is not a dirty, commodified thing. It's telling people what you stand for. So develop a brand based on values that you want to stand behind and what you want to offer the world. And in this case, children. Who is your customer? What kind of cool things you want to make? Okay, nobody is forcing you. I think that's why the corporate speak really bothers me because I think it sounds like you're going to make whatever it is that is going to sell and you're not going to have any heart attached to it. You're not going to be attached to making a product that you believe in. Just a real heartless, cold, corporate approach to design, which I am not really for. Okay, past that. You still need to do the rest of the design process the same. Find some images that inspire you, okay? And work with those images to create some cute prints, some cute patches, emblems, you know? Like maybe your theme is elephants, little baby cartoon elephants, and you do cartoon elephant prints, and you get some cute little uh, elephant-shaped wood buttons, like, Elephant, 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 whatever, okay? You need to put together a fun color story. I think Celine Dion did a children's wear line that was gender neutral and all black and white, okay? Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's what that was. And that's really cool. That's her distinct, you know, where she's coming from. And, you know, I'm not a really big fan of um, celebrity brands. Like I assess celebrity brands the same way I assess non-celebrity brands. Like I'm not going to be all for it if I think it sucks. Um, like I like rare beauty because the products are actually good. I have a few, uh, rare beauty products and they actually perform really well. I thought the thinking behind Celine Dion's children's wear collection was really smart and clever and something that the market needed. And so, to me, the celebrity attached was just like marketing, but not, you know, my opinion was based on the product. Once you've decided your colors, you have to think about your fabrics. And trust me, unless you're talking about like that real small sliver of the designer children's wear market and also like a that whole Easter dress market, you want everything to be machine washable. A no parent taking their kids to get stuff dry clean on the regular, okay? They are gonna buy like uh, the occasional fancy dress for their seniors family portrait for, you know, Christmas card portraits for their big fancy Christmas party. But on the regular, it's all going in the machine. And if it's not going in the machine, forget it. It will get destroyed in the machine. They'll be like, oops, I just assumed because it was children's wear, it was machine washable. And the parent would be right in that regard. You take all the colors and the inspiration and the prints and the fabrics, and then you put together some cute silhouettes, some comfy shapes that kids will wear, okay? My dude, 
your stuff looks generic and indistinguishable because you didn't think the design process applied to you. You slapped some stuff together. You didn't think that design for children mattered and you probably didn't put any effort into it. Maybe you also don't think design is work. And now you have a bunch of stuff that's not moving because it's not special. The only people who can get away with selling stuff that doesn't look special are people who, you know, celebrity lines where they're such big celebrities that people just buy the stupid crap because their favorite celebrity is attached to it. But you are not a celebrity, so you have to try harder. Go to some parents and talk about what they need. One time I had this conversation with a mom who had both boys and girls, and she told me that it was so easy to find dressy occasion things for girls, but it was very difficult to find the equivalent for boys. And I guess because, you know, that kind of design is boring for designers that people don't want to design. I mean, granted, it is fun to design cute little dress dresses with ruffles and sparkly things and whatnot, but yeah, that market is missing. There are a lot of things out there where people are concerned with how sustainable kids' clothing is because they outgrow them so fast. Like physically, their bodies get so big so fast that they grow out of them before the clothes wear out. And it's also like one of these things where people find, make that as an excuse to buy fast fashion because they have to throw it away anyway, which I think you know how I feel about that. But that is a concern, you know, an interesting design problem to work out. Like, how can you provide children's wear? Can you make something that is adjustable so that a child can wear it for longer? So because it adjusts as the body grows, like as can the kid wear it comfortably? OK, because I tell you what. Sure, hand-me-downs are real and, you know, I love those like free cycling communities where, you know, parents have these clothes and they give it on to expectant moms, things like that. But what about the rest? You know, a lot of parents, they are not opting for multiple children anymore. Not that I blame them. Children are a lot of work. Um, also like design. Sorry, I'm going to let that go. <laughs> But yeah, you need to talk to some parents. You need to talk about what they have to deal with when they're shopping, you know, straight from the source. That's what you got to do. You got to do some research and also make things that are cute. You know, some people are like, oh, I don't want to look at other stuff because I don't want to in it. I don't want to copy their stuff because it got wiggled into my brain. And it's like, well, you might also inadvertently copy their stuff because you did a bunch of stuff that other people are already doing and it just makes you look dumb. So yeah, go look for what's out there and try to do something that is in line with kind of the basic trends of what kids are wearing, but also your own special twist to it, okay? Some people, they don't like my design process because they think it takes too long and they would rather just make whatever is rolling around in their brain. And then later they'll send me emails like this one saying, how come my ideas aren't cool? Or I ran out of ideas, or I only have the same five ideas I make over and over again. How can I switch that? My answer is always gonna be, Follow my design process. It is actually something that is built on how design is done in the real world. And it is crafted to get you to think about new things and not just regurgitate the same ideas that you had going on in your brain for a long time. Nobody wants to see that yet again, okay? Come up with something new. There really is a difference between having existing house codes where you repeat themes over and over again and just doing the same thing over and over and over again, so. That's how I feel about that. Today got a little bit long and ranty. I was in a ranty mood today, but just so you can have a peek at my inbox and the kind of occasionally infuriating, occasionally only annoying uh, emails that I get on the regular basis. Where was I? Anyways, if you have a question you would like me to answer in a future podcast episode, drop me a question in the comments or email me at teachingatzoeyong.com. Share, subscribe, all the ways you show me love, and I will see you in the next video.